Hi everyone, and welcome to this month's Federal Policy Update from Bike Walk Action. My name is Karen Whitaker. I'm the director of Bike Walk Action. And Bike Walk Action is a coalition of state and local groups and some national groups. It was formed by Bike New York and the League of American Bicyclists. Today I'd like to give you an update on the transportation budget because we've seen some movement on that in Congress and particularly to let you know about the Woodall Amendment. I'll also give you an update on the infrastructure package, the infrastructure investment that the White House has been talking about. Looks like the Senate is moving forward with something. And then give you a quick update on what we're watching in tax reform and on some new legislation on automated vehicles. So moving on to the budget. This is my favorite graphic of showing the federal budget process. I realize it's out of date. It's still got President Obama, but I haven't seen a better one yet. So we're in the middle box, which is what happens in Congress. The House has gone all the way across the top. They've had the final floor votes, and they're now waiting for the Senate to vote on theirs. Once the Senate votes, then the two chambers will form a conference committee and create a compromise bill. So in early September, the House passed the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development budget as part of a much larger budget bill. There are multiple amendments introduced, I think over 40 on transportation and HUD. There were multiple amendments trying to refund TIGER. TIGER is a grant program that was founded under the Obama administration that funds projects that are hard to fund under regular transportation projects, usually because they involve multimodal projects or projects that cross state lines. So it might be a bridge across state lines that includes a bus lane and a bike lane and a pedestrian sidewalk or something like that. So multi-modes, et cetera. The House this year zeroed out the TIGER funding. And so a lot of members in, in the House introduced amendments to try to get that funding back. Unfortunately, none of them were ruled in order. Part of that is because when you do an amendment in the House on the budget, if you say you want to put $500 million into TIGER, you have to say where you want to take that money out. And a lot of these amendments didn't do it. And part of it is that the majority party did just did not want to see those go forward. So although multiple amendments were introduced, none were ruled in order, and we did not get a vote on that. We did get a vote on an amendment by Mr. Woodall, who's a representative from outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And that amendment passed. And that amendment, if it is in the final bill, will hurt local government funding and could potentially hurt biking and walking funding. To understand what the Woodall Amendment does, you first need to understand what rescissions are. Rescissions are when Congress takes back or rescinds a percentage of unspent funding from each of the state DOTs. So if a state does not prioritize or deprioritizes biking and walking programs, or programs that help local governments, those funds can get hit harder than others because there's more money there to rescind. However, in the underlying bill, in the original budget bill, Congress had put in some safeguards on that. They had exempted the local government funds, which allows local governments to have certainty on funding so that when they plan year to year, they know how much funding they're going to get for the next three to five years, so they can plan out their priorities and what they're going to do. Now, if the state can just rescind their money without consultation, without warning, then it's very hard for local governments to plan and to know what they can build year to year. The original bill also required that those rescissions be proportional across programs. So you, if you were going to take 5% from the highway program, you could you also take 5% from transportation alternatives. And that you can't take 1% from one program and 30% from another. So to visualize this, I'm going to go through a, a simplified example of what how rescissions work. So let's say Congress has apportioned $30 billion equally across three programs. So this is in one state, one state is getting 
10 billion for the surface transportation block grant program. They're getting 10 billion for congestion mitigation and air quality and 10 billion for the national highway program. So Congress gives the state that money, but they tell them you can only spend 27 billion of it that we're going to rescind 3 billion at the end of the year. Under the original bill, Congress also says, okay, half half of the surface transportation block grant program is suballocated to local governments. So in rescissions, Congress said that money you can't touch. That's local government money and it is exempted from rescissions. And then it looks at how much the government is going to, then the year goes on and we see how much that state has spent. So in this example, let's say this, the state spent an additional $4 billion of the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program, which is very likely, this is a very flexible funding, very easy to spend on that. On the National Highway Program, they spent $4 billion over there as well. But under the congestion mitigation and air quality, they only spent 2%, because that is a program that states don't like as much. A lot of those projects go to cities and local governments. So now they have to do their... 3 billion rescissions, they can only rescind from the green part of each program and it has to be proportional. So that's what you see. There's only a billion left of STBGP, the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program. So 0.2, gets re 0.2 billion is rescinded. CMAC is less it gets spent, so 1.6 billion gets, gets rescinded. So you see how that proportionality works. Now, when you add the Woodall Amendment, the Woodall Amendment removes the proportionality clause from rescissions, and it re removes the exemption for sub-allocated funding. And what we see when this happens is that because states are really focused on transportation in between communities rather than inside communities, they're more likely to spend and to obligate those, that funding first. And so when they are having to give back money, they're more likely to take from the, the programs they don't use as much that are not as helpful to the state level, i.e. the ones that are helpful to the local government. So that's those suballocated funds, it's transportation alternatives, it's the CMAC and metropolitan planning. So same example, state has 10 billion across these funds. The state knows it's going to have to rescind $3 billion at the end of the year. So that suballocated funding is now allowable to be rescinded. And the transportation alternatives, which is part of the STBGP program, they no longer have to be proportional on re rescissions from transportation alternatives. So a state could, if it wanted to, take all of the transportation alternatives or all of the suballocated or some combination of that. And that's what we're worried about. We're not the only ones who are worried about it. All the local government associations are also worried. The Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations, the National Association of Regional Councils, um, those are programs that work on the MPO funding level, Metropolitan Planning Organization level, but also the League of Cities, which is smaller cities, the, the United Conference of Mayors, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the cities are worried about it, and then you've got the counties and the National Association of Development Organizations, which are generally in rural areas. They're all concerned about it. This is their letter. They're expressing opposition to the Woodall Amendment, and they point out that it would allow states to draw disproportionately from programs that provide the greatest amount of help for local projects, Surface Transportation Block Grant Program, Transportation Alternative, CMAC, Metropolitan Planning. So what you can do for this, and we really hope you, you can help because this is important, I want you to call your district, contact the district office of your representative. Sorry, I have visit there. So contact the office. If you don't know who your representative is, you can Google find your representative, or you can go to this website at house.gov representative slash find. And then go to their website and look for a district office by you. Almost 
here's an example from Representative Barletta in Pennsylvania, but most of their websites will have a contact comment and that will give you the offices. Congress is home this week, so this is a great time to reach out to them in their district offices. You, members, uh, staff members in Congress offices often tell me, you know, it takes 20 or 30 emails into their office for them to pay attention. But if they get, you know, five to eight calls in their district office, that gets a lot of attention because people rarely call that office. And that's why we're focused on this, because this is a local issue. It's particularly important if any of these members are your member to call them. Uh, Representative Diaz Ballart from near Miami. Uh, he is the chair of the committee. And then David Price, who's outside of Raleigh, North Carolina, he is the highest ranking Democrat, the ranking member. But all of these members are important because even though it's passed the House, the House and the Senate are going to compromise on this. The Senate bill does not have rescissions, so it doesn't have a Woodall Amendment. So whoever from this group gets to be part of that compromise table, they can decide what they really need from the, from the House bill to make it in and what they don't need. And we don't want the Woodall Amendment to get into the final bill. So if you can contact your member of Congress, we have a script for you. Um, you want to let people, you want to let them know what you're calling about. So. I would like to leave comments regarding the Woodall Amendment, which passed the House as part of the Transportation HUD Appropriations Bill. And then we have some talking points. The Woodall Amendment hurts local communities like ours. The Woodall Amendment strips local control of transportation funding, making it impossible for local governments to plan and implement around their local transportation priorities. Two, the Woodall Am Amendment contradicts the 2015 FAST Act. The FAST Act, which was the transportation authorization, specifically gave local government control over a small amount of transportation funding to help meet local priorities. The Woodall Amendment negates this. A couple more. The Woodall Amendment is unfair. It allows states to take local funding to pay rescissions. Wouldn't we all like to pay our rent or mortgage with someone else's money, right? And then this is a final one. Our community deserves to plan for our own priorities. And then if you can think of a local transportation priority in your community, talk about that. And say that our that the region needs certainty to be able to build projects like that. And the final ask is please don't let the Woodall Amendment move forward. Please do not let the Woodall Amendment be included in the final budget for 2018. Now, the appropriators could be on that conference committee with the Senate. Other members are not, but they can help by talking to appropriators and expressing their concerns. So you have all this in the email. In the presentation, we'll also send it via email. Just so you know, the state budget does not have rescissions, so they can't have a Woodall Amendment. We're expecting the Senate to vote on their budget in late October. Um, we do not at this point expect to see any amendments specific to biking and walking, but if we do, we'll make sure to report on them. And what you can do right now is watch the league blog and your email for potential alerts. The next thing I want to talk about is the infrastructure package. All year, we've been hearing about how President Trump wants a big investment in infrastructure. Congress as well wants an investment in infrastructure. You know, everyone's kind of been waiting for tax reform. So again, these are the issues on the table in Congress. The budget is a must do. It has been, it was supposed to pass at the end of September. They extended it two months, which is why we were still talking about the budget. Uh, right now, they're really working on tax reform, and they're starting to talk about infrastructure. Now, we're watching the back and forth because in order for infrastructure to move forward, Congress needs to find the money to do that. That will depend a little bit on the budget and a lot on tax reform, so we're waiting to see on that. But Congress 
keeps talking about an infrastructure bill as something they want to pass that they can bring home to the voters for next year's elections. So the Senate has already started to move forward. They want to put their imprint on whatever this infrastructure package is. Chairman Barrasso on the top, he is the Republican chairman of the committee. He's expected to introduce an infrastructure bill in the next few weeks. On the bottom, you have the ranking member, Democrat Tom Carper from Delaware. Right now, the bill that Chairman Barrasso is expected to introduce is not bipartisan. But they're talking and they're trying to figure out what can happen to make this a bipartisan bill. We're expecting it to be $25 billion over five years. So it extends the FAST Act for a few years and then adds, I think, $5 billion each year, which seems like a lot of money when you talk about $5 billion. But the transportation bill right now is $52 billion, So it's an increase of about 5%. We also expect it to really focus on streamlining environmental regulations and getting things through the permitting process. And that's one of the rubs that's keeping it from being too bipartisan. On what you can expect in the next couple months, uh, if the bill becomes bipartisan, it has a much better chance of moving forward. Any infrastructure package that passes is going to need 60 votes in the Senate, so it will need Democrats. So if it's bipartisan, then we really, if we hear it's going to be bipartisan, we really want to work with our allies on both sides of the aisle to, to make the bill stronger, to improve transportation alternatives. And we're also talking about an amendment that offers incentives for states to address speed and, and slow down, lower the speed limit in municipalities. If it's not bipartisan, then the bill has little to no chance of becoming law. And so if that happens, then we, we'll still do amendments, but we may do bigger amendments. We may ask for larger things to just put a marker out there, like these are the things we care about. This is what we want to go forward. The timeline on that is we expect the bill, there's some talk that the bill will be released this week, but maybe in late October. But when it happens, it happens fast. Once usually staff members of the committee, the members and the staff of the committee, they have a little time to look at it before it becomes public. But once it becomes public, they can vote on it and hold the amendment process within the committee within three days. And so this works really fast. That's when advocates like Bike Walk Action we get in there, we suggest amendments, we work with allies to come up with them, we try to build support, and it's this crazy busy period. And then the committee marks up the bill, which means that's when they have amendments, and they, if they pass it out of committee, they may push it to the floor. So again, there could be a lot happening in the Senate in the next couple weeks, so please follow the blog, watch for your emails. Finally, I want to give you some updates on some other bills that are moving through Congress. First on automated vehicles, there's a bill that's already passed the House and the Senate, it's passed the Senate committee, the Senate is ready to vote on it. There's some good things about this bill. It, um, it's a way to get testing of automated vehicles underway. We need these products to be tested. But it also requires that any vehicles that are put on the road to be tested already have to meet certain safety standards like pedestrian recognition, like making sure they recognize stop signs, all of those things should be there. Some of the positives as well is that it offers the potential to significantly cut down on distracted driving and speeding. Um, most crashes are caused by driver fault, and so if it's a computer driving, it may be better. It will also help define the concerns related uh, to the ability of infrastructure to, to work with the cars and cars to work with the infrastructure. I just want to clarify two terms that we think about when we think about this, this legislation. Automated vehicles, so this on the left, 
It's the car behind that can tell, okay, there's a car in front of me. There's two pedestrians. It's the car looking around itself and sensing things. It is not talking to other cars. That's connected vehicles. That is something else. And when we get to connected vehicles, we're going to have to talk about, well, in both cases, we have to talk about how do you recognize bicyclists? How do you recognize people walking? And then with connected cars, how are they talking amongst themselves? And there's a great explainer put out by the Pedestrian Bicycle Information Center. The website is on the bottom. If you're interested in this, I think this is a great resource to get caught up in that. Going back to the legislation, a little bit of what it does, it allows testing of vehicles. So for year one, each manufacturer is allowed to put 25,000 on the roads. Year two, each manufacturer puts, can put up to 50,000 vehicles on the road. Year three, 100,000. Um, so we could have a few million of these cars on the roads in three years. Um, some of the concerns we have about the bill is that it allows for preempting of state and local laws that are an unreasonable restriction on the, per on the performance of automated vehicles. So, for instance, if a local community, I think Chicago, has said we don't want automated vehicles, they may not be allowed to say that. The, the federal government wants to make sure that these products are out there and getting tested, but it's a concern where the local governments are generally in charge of safety and of the infrastructure that we're hoping these vehicles are able to read. The other concern we have is around crash data. So the crash data from these vehicles will be reported to NHTSA as are all crashes that involve a serious injury or a fatality. However, the manufacturers do not have to provide the crash, other crash data to cities, to academics or advocates, and they're not subject to FOIA, which is um, the Freedom of Information Act. So that makes it a little harder for local governments to plan on how automated vehicles are going to affect them, to know what's going on in their community, and to react to it. So those are some concerns. Uh, Transportation for America is working on that. We are talking with them about how we can help, but just wanted to let you know that that's happening. Overall, I think we definitely want automated vehicles to be tested. It's hard to test them. They've been tested under laboratory situations. They need to be tested on the road, and so we are watching this carefully to make sure that it's done in as safe a way as possible. And hopefully that that information can then be shared and used both for infrastructure and for safety transportation laws. Also on tax reform, Congress has moved a baby step uh, closer to doing tax reform in that we've heard that they're passing a budget resolution. So there's two things that we're talking about. The actual appropriations, the amounts of money that go to each program that I was talking about at the beginning of the webinar, that's the appropriations process that has passed, or it's passed the House. Um, the budget resolution is where you put in the rules for the budget and you also think long term. So the budget looks at 10 years down the line. But it also is where you can put in instructions for budget reconciliation which is the process for which the Senate can pass a few things that are deficit neutral uh, with only 50 votes. And that's what they're trying to do for tax reform. So the Senate passed it a week ago or so. The Senate is getting ready to vote on that. So, and then those will need to agree, and then they'll get, um, they'll get that reconciliation for moving to tax form. What well, we're watching on tax form, one, we are looking for funding for transportation or for an infrastructure package. That is becoming increasingly unlikely because we saw in the tax reform package that came out that was worked on by the big six, people from the White House, people from the House, people from the Senate, 
that doesn't include new funds for transportation. In fact, it shows a significant decrease in funds for transportation. So it's a little bit confusing and contradictory to the idea of an infrastructure package. So we are watching that to see if funding goes up or if there is new funding for transportation. We will also be looking at commuter benefits. We've heard that it's potent that there is potential that all the commuter benefits will be repealed, not just the bike benefit, but also the transit and the parking benefits. And if that happens, if all benefits are on the table, Bike Walk Action will look to fix the bike benefit, will look to support the transit benefit, and try to make the two compatible. So that's what I have for a policy update. I also want to encourage all of you to pencil in the National Bike Summit in 2018, March 5th through 7th here in Washington, DC. We have a request for proposals that's out. We would love to hear from you. Uh, those proposals are due October 31st, but if you have a good idea about our theme, Grassroots Growing Together, successes that you've seen in your community, topics you'd like us to talk about at the summit, please fill out a request for proposal and join us in Washington March 5th through 7th. And the webinar, uh, excuse me, the website for those proposals is on the bottom. Thank you again for listening. My name is Karen Whitaker, and I'm very interested in hearing any questions, comments, or suggestions that you have for these webinars. Please email me at karen at clwconsulting.net. Thanks, and I'll talk to you next month.